mind that the Lord Jesus is prophesied even in the book of Genesis. And I want to start with the story of Judah. And we find in Genesis chapter 49, at the end of, of Jacob's life, uh, Jacob being the father of um, uh, the, the sons there, the 12 sons, and, and uh, we find that now he's getting to the end of his life in chapter 49, and he calls his sons around him to give blessings. And if you remember, I, I wish I could go back through all the history of, of Jew, the hi, history of the Israelites there and the Jews, but um, Judah was uh, not the firstborn. Uh, there were four brothers ahead of Judah that could have gotten the blessing, and according to Jewish tradition and law, the oldest son was to get the, the main blessing, but the older four had forfeited that blessing through immorality and through violence, and you can read that story and understand that history, but uh, now it came down to Judah, and Judah, after a kind of a shaky start, had really proved himself to be one that was worthy of that leadership and that blessing. Uh, God chose to set his blessing upon him. Remember, it was Judah the one that saved Joseph from uh, being killed while he was in that pit. You remember, uh, Judah came along and talked his brothers into selling him into slavery instead of killing him. And then after uh, many years in Egypt, after uh, the, the brothers would come back to Egypt and be reunited with Joseph just before they came, or just before they were united, Joseph knew his brothers were there and laid a trap. Remember, Benjamin had a little cup planted in his uh, the king's cup planted in his sack of, of uh, grain, and uh, they had to come back. And boy, it was uh, J Joseph put on this feigned anger about this whole thing and how they were treacherous and trying to, you know, betray him and so forth. And it was Judah, the one who offered himself to stay in place of Benjamin to preserve his father's life. And so Judah really had this heart of sacrifice. He had this heart of love. And really, ultimately, I think that reflected throughout his life. Now, there were some times where he failed, there's, without a doubt. Uh, most notably, um, he failed to keep a promise to his daughter-in-law. And uh, his daughter-in-law did some sneaky things and played the part of the harlot. And you remember that story. And as soon as he found out that he was caught in this, he immediately repented. No excuse for the sin, but, but he did repent, and I'm thankful for that. But the, the fact of the matter is, God used Judah in a tremendous way. And now we find God laying a blessing on Judah by way of his father, right at the end of his father's life, Jacob. And I want to pick up, if I can, in verse number 8 of chapter 49 in Genesis. Notice the Bible says here, and again, this is Jacob speaking, and he says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall thy gathering, or the gathering of the people, be. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is cold unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood or the fruit of, or the, the juice of grapes. I'm going to stop there and go back if I can. The Bible teaches us here in verses 8 through 10 really a prophecy about not only Judah as a nation or excuse me as a tribe and family, but ultimately I believe there was a secondary thought and a secondary prophecy here. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. But often in Scripture we find that there was in prophecy, when someone was declaring something to be true, obviously Jacob was, Jacob was moved by the Lord to prophesy these things and to give the blessing to his son. And these things were immediately applicable to the son. In other words, he was going to see these things come to pass in his lifetime or in his children's lifetime. And we know by history that they did. Judah would be the one who would have the dominion. People would bow down to him in the sense of praising him, not him individually, but that tribe, and, and they would rise to a level of prominence within the nation of Israel. And so that was an immediate context of the prophecy, but I also know, and we know now from Scripture, that there was often a meaning that goes beyond that, and that goes ultimately into eternity. 
And uh, that's the amazing thing about God. He can take something immediately and make it true, but also true in eternity or in the future as well. And there's many places in Scripture that that's true. Um, I, I could give you several illustrations uh, concerning that. But the fact is that this also is referring to the coming of the Savior. And we have a little bit of idea of that as we look into verse number, um, once again, if you look at verse number 9, uh, no, excuse me, verse 10, the Bible says, until Shiloh come. Now that's an epithet dealing with the Messiah. This is, uh, Shiloh obviously was a place, it was a city in Israel, but it was so insignificant that we, we understand that that's not what we're talking about. And obviously it's very clear here who he's talking about. He's talking about the Messiah. And it's looked back on as the Lord Jesus himself. And so there was, a, there was a double prophecy concerning not only Judah, the tribe, but ultimately the fact that there was going to be this elongation of his ministry and, and influence. Uh, we know that the Bible talks about later on that David would come through the tribe of Judah. And that's exactly right. God promised that for David, the, the Davidic covenant, that there would never cease to be on the throne someone from the tribe of Judah out of the house of David. And that obviously is dealing with the Lord Jesus. Now I'm saying all that tonight to tell you that when we're talking about Jesus tonight, we're talking about someone who God uh, the Bible teaches us was in existence long before he ever came to this earth. He was eternal. And one of the names that I want to speak on tonight, one of the titles that we're going to talk about here tonight is this idea of the title, the name given to the Savior, associated with him not only here in the book of Genesis, but ultimately in the book of Revelation as well. Would you turn over there, Revelation chapter 5. I just want to read this to you and then we'll come back to it later on uh, this evening just before we finish. But Revelation chapter 5 as if it was a, a, an unknown, something that we weren't sure of in uh, Genesis chapter 49, we have a very expressed um, comment given to us, and it, it's dealing with the Lord Jesus beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm not going to read the whole passage right now, but the picture is that in heaven there was a seal, uh, seven seals that needed to be opened, a book with seven seals. And uh, there was a, a great kind of anxiety in heaven. The Bible says in verse number four, I wept much, John said, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, uh, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders, verse number five, said, saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Tonight I want to speak, if I can, on this title, The Name of the Lord, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. And I'm thankful tonight that we can serve a God who has such a likeness, such a symbolism of being the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Now, the Tribe of Judah was going to become known as the Lion Tribe. It was on their crest, their, their flag and their banner, that they would have a lion on there. That was well known based on the prophecy from Jacob in Genesis chapter 49. And it's interesting that that same, that same picture and that symbol is used for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, other places in the scripture, I know that even Satan himself is described as a lion. The Bible says, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. We know that to be the case. Obviously, those are mixed metaphors. In the sense of what we're talking about, we're talking about the lion that is um, uh, synonymous with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? And I, tonight, I want to just share a few things, if I can, with you. And this veiled reference in Genesis to the Messiah... And the fact that he's associated with the tribe of Judah help us to see that it's dealing with the Messiah. As I mentioned, Judah was known as this lion tribe. And, and of course, we know in both the genealogies in the New Testament that Jesus descended down through the tribe of Judah. And so this prophetic passage brings a clear understanding of who Jesus would be, what his role, what his mission would look like in the form of this picture of the lion. Now look with me, if you would, tonight at two things that I believe this shows us about our Savior. Number one, if He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, then the Bible teaches us that He is the conquering King. I'm praising the Lord tonight that as the emphasis is on this idea, the picture of the Lion, it's emphasizing the power and the majesty and the authority over all of His creation. 
You know, the lion is to be feared among all beasts. I know there's a lot of dangerous things out there. I know uh, recently I've talked to somebody and, you know, they, they fear little ticks. You know, have you ever had a tick on you? And, and that could be fearful. You see one of those little things crawling around on you like, ah, get off me, you know. And, and I understand that. And, you know, we're afraid of different things and all the different animals. But there's nothing so striking and so fearful and fearsome as a lion. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever had a chance to become close and intimately involved with a lion? I haven't myself. I've seen them in zoos, and they've always been behind the, the, the glass and so forth. But I'm telling you what, to see the size of some of these lions it's unbelievable. Now, I'm not trying to glorify a lion. They obviously have their weaknesses and they're not indomitable, but there are not many other animals to be naturally as feared as a lion. And I want to look at some of those things. Obviously, there's a reason that God uses the symbolism in the prophecy to describe the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's fitting for us to see him as this conquering king, emphasizing his power, his majesty, and his authority. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 30 says, A lion, which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. Now tonight, I want you to understand that the characteristic of the lion is not to run away. Now I know that there's probably videos of lions running away from a pack of hyenas or whatever, but the fact is, a lion doesn't run away from very many things at all, if any. The lion is not one to run away. And obviously Solomon writing in the book of Proverbs understood this. He was observing this and he could see the strongest among beasts. It's amazing the strength of the lion and the power and the majesty. Just the absolute domination of that lion. Then Proverbs 28 verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And the idea is that a lion is not worried about, you know, uh, figuring out strength. If there's something to take over, if there's something to stand for, that lion is going to do it. He's not going to ask questions. He's not going to back down. He's bold. And I love the illustration of that. The Bible teaches here in 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 10, he also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion. Now this is obviously picking up in the story, but the idea there is that th there is a certain heart of a lion. I don't, I'm not talking about the physical beating heart. I'm talking about the disposition and the characteristics of that lion. The, the idea is there, that heart of a lion, I think we all would understand, is one that is unabashedly strong, powerful. They're not going to go uh, and turn away. They're not going to run away from something. The lion is the peak of this kind of domination when we're talking about it. Amos chapter 3 and verse 8, The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord, hath, the Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? In the same way that the lion roars and strikes fear into the heart. I, I remember we had opportunity to be at, at the zoo one time, and the lion was sitting up on his rock there, and he wasn't roaring, he was just kind of, I don't know, but even that little roar, 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 I mean, it was just echoing through the whole zoo. And I mean, it's just unbelievable. Don't you love my lion impersonation? Okay, so the idea there is that this lion roars, and, it, and you can imagine being in the wild, maybe uh, like Brother Brian sleeping out under the stars at night, and hearing that, that lion roar not far away from you, that would strike fear into the heart. I know what it's like to be sitting out on my back porch and hear the coyotes howling across the street kind of sends the shivers through you, you know, it's like, where are they at? And when are they going to be in my yard, you know? But you can imagine this lion roaring. The, the fact of the matter is when that lion roars, who doesn't fear? Who doesn't think of their own safety? All right? So you get kind of a picture here of what a lion looks like. And now that we're looking at this, we understand then why God would use the symbolism of a lion of the tribe of Judah to describe our Savior. And, and if our Savior is a conquering king, may I tell you tonight that the king is bold. The Bible teaches that Jesus is uh, fearless in the sense that when he was even here on this earth, he, he was kind, there's no doubt about it, but he was bold. He did not shy away from the confrontation or from standing for truth. There was no situation that he would back away from or he would turn away from or he would shy away from. When the truth needed to be stood for, Jesus stood for the truth. And I'm thankful that he was bold like that lion. 
The Bible teaches that Jesus, in John chapter 2 and verse number 14, they found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables. And they said, uh, uh, said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. I want to tell you tonight, Jesus was bold. And that idea of that characteristic that I believe in his humanity allowed him to stand up against the sin and wickedness of the day is not only seen in his humanity, but in his divinity. And that is one day the whole earth will know all of creation will bow before him. There's not going to be one person that's going to stand and shake a fist. I think of the powerful uh, human in institutions and organizations today. And it feels like we're so small in comparison to them. And I'm telling you, it feels like we're overpowered. I'm talking about Jesus and, and his followers. It seems like the world is so powerful and the powers that be are reigning. And, and there's just nothing that can stand against them. But I'm saying tonight that we serve a Savior who is bold. And there is no question in my mind that in that time, not only in his humanity here on this earth, but in his divinity, when he's revealed as the King of Kings, he will stand and there will be no question who the power belongs to. There will be no question about where people need to give their allegiance. And when God speaks, there will be no question who is in charge. And I'm thankful tonight that we have a God who didn't walk away from the challenge to the truth. He was not intimidated by the logic or the structures of mankind. He was bold as a lion. He stood for that truth, and I'm thankful. They often would try to set a trap for him and to menace him and to bring some sort of a, of a device against him. The Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation that even Satan himself will gather an army together and stand before that King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will try to do his best against him. But I'm telling you, there's no backing down. And the devil that day will see his demise because we have a bold Savior, a conquering King who is bold as a lion. I'm thankful tonight for that. But I want you to also understand that not only is the King bold, but the King has authority. What do I mean by authority? Well, we're talking about authority in our adult Bible fellowship. I, I don't know where all the classes are, but the lesson that was produced this week is dealing with the authority that we have in our lives the idea of authority is that person who has the right or the obligation to hold influence and to hold order over us. The idea there is that the king has authority. We find that back in Genesis chapter 49 again, where the Bible teaches that the scepter in verse number 10 shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet. Now, a lot of people would say, well, uh, you know, that's dealing with that time in Judah's history and that scepter, the power, the authority would not go away in his kingship until the time that Shiloh would come. But I want to tell you tonight that that's, though that is true, we also know it to be true that the scepter that we're talking about here in chapter 49 and verse 10 is dealing with the authority of God himself. Jesus holds all authority. My friend tonight, that word authority is a dirty word for most of the world. And people try to shirk authority they try to get out from underneath authority they try to they try to malign and question authority and i i understand that human authority is broken and sinful and many times makes failures and and uh, has problems but the fact of the matter we have an authority over us god himself the person the lord jesus christ and our king jesus is our authority that is that to the degree to which we submit our lives and our will and our desires to Him, even our thoughts, is the degree to which we are submitting to His authority. Authority is unquestionable when it's talked about in the scope of the Lord Jesus. There is not a place, there is not a person, there is not a situation where He does not hold authority over in this world. You say, well, I don't think He really has power, maybe in some of these areas, it seems like he's just not there. I assure you, without a doubt, that he has authority. He may not be exercising his authority in that area right now, but there is no question about it. He is in control. We serve a Savior, a King, who has authority. And the Bible teaches this also where it talks about, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. 
Now, I don't know what that, that looks like in your mind, but man, it, it looks to me like someone holding someone by the, by the neck like this, right? Or maybe by the back of the neck, right? And it's like a, it's like a kid who, uh, the, kid, the parents are trying to get him out of the store as quick as possible, the most dignified way possible, you know? So the parents just simply grab the children by the nape of the neck, very firmly, and escort them kindly out the door. Now, that parent is exercising authority over that person because he has his hand in the neck of that person. Now, the Bible teaches that that's kind of the, that's the picture that we're looking at here. And obviously, Judah, in the time when he was um, in control there and have an influence in Israel, he had that sort of power. But we're talking about the King Jesus. We're talking about someone who has authority over people. I want to encourage you this evening that God is the righteous judge. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. He has all things in his authority. As I mentioned already, there is not one thing that will happen to us this week that God does not have control over and does not have the say over. You say, well, I don't like this and I don't think it's good. I understand your kids don't like everything you do either. But he always does only what is good for us. And his authority in our life needs to be submitted to. That is, we ought not to question it. We ought not to ignore it. I'm not going to try to put myself up against it. And listen, I know we all mean well, but we so often default to our own authority. What does this person want to do? I know what God says. And you know, in this realm, he can have his authority. But in this realm, I have my authority. I want to tell you, that's not the, that's not the thought of the Christian. The Christian is God has authority in every area of my life. That is, he can tell me what to do, what not to do. He can lead me kindly because I trust him. Submit to the authority of your king. He is a king with authority. And that's exactly, you can picture the lion. The lion has authority on the plane, didn't he? Doesn't he? There's nothing that's going to stand against that lion. If that lion wants that kill, he's going to come and get it. Now, I've seen some female lions come up against a male lion. The male lion runs. I'm not going to get into that dynamic, okay? But the lion is unquestionably authoritative. When the lion exercises his will, there's nothing that's going to stand against that and come out good on the other end. So the point I'm saying is that this king has authority and uh, our king has authority this evening. We're talking tonight about a conquering king, Jesus the conquering king. But notice if you would lastly concerning this, that Jesus the king has power. Now, it's one thing to have authority. It's, it's one thing to have authority with power. Now, authority has within it the understanding that you have the power or the right or the ability to do what you have authority to do. It's a sad day when you have authority to do something but no power behind it. That's like my grandpa. He used to tell the story when he was alive. He was in World War II right at the end. He was part of the occupation force in Germany. And uh, he got over there. My, now, my grandpa was, I think he was... Well, at least when I knew him, he was about five foot two and uh, just a little guy, just as full of spunk as you can get. But Grandpa Poor was sent to the, uh, Germany with occupation forces, just a little guy, and uh, he was given a certain detachment of um, German soldiers that were POWs, and they were, they were getting, you know, work back into the system, whatever, and he was, he was supposed to keep track of them. And so they gave him a rifle and told him, you keep track of these guys and they take them where they need to go and make sure they get there safely. The problem was they gave him a rifle with no ammo. And uh, now it was on purpose. He was part of the peacekeeping force, not part of the uh, warfare force. But, you know, he used to laugh and joke. He said, I, here's a little five foot two guy walking around here with a little, you know, a little rifle walking back and forth. And you do this. And he'd point his finger up here. You come over and do this. And he said he would just laugh and laugh because if they wanted to do something to him, he couldn't do anything about it. Now, the fact of the matter is, that's not the kind of authority we're talking about. Jesus not only has the authority, that is the sovereignty over everything, but he has the power over that. He, he literally can control the circumstance. He can control the situation. He can make the things right that needs to be right. This is the person we're talking about. Now, I think there's a lot of animals. If you come to my house tonight, you would, you would be greeted by a dog who thinks he has a, she has authority in our house. Now, uh, she would bark and bark and bark and bark, but I'll tell you, very quickly, she'll be licking your hands and sitting by you and, you know, whatever else. She has no power behind that authoritative bark. The fact is, God has authority and he has the power. 
in it. And I'm thankful for that tonight. The Bible says that scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from be, um, uh, between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The power of the king. And I'm thankful that we serve a savior that is victorious tonight and, or excuse me, conquering. There's no question about his authority. There's no question about his power. And no wonder the picture is of a lion because that's exactly what the lion shows in our human realm. Notice though, lastly tonight, not only is Jesus the conquering king, but he is the victorious savior. Now this is where I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter five, because it's interesting that as we look at Jesus, we see him in Genesis, and then we see him all the way over in Revelation. From beginning to end, from cover to cover, Jesus is given. I'd love sometime to go through every book of the Bible and show how Jesus is referenced or symbolized in that book. Every single book shows Jesus in some way, and I'm thankful for that picture tonight. But notice in Revelation chapter 5, and look, at, look with me, verse number 1. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I, was, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. I'm in verse 2 of Revelation 5. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Oh, I'm telling you, there's probably a lot of people that wanted to look in that book. A lot of people thought, maybe I'll try. Nope, nobody was worthy. Nobody had the authority. Nobody had the power. Nobody had the virtue and the purity to open that book. Not one person was found on earth or in heaven. Not one man, the Bible teaches us. And the verse 4 says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Now, aren't you thankful for knowledge tonight? Knowledge is such a wonderful thing. Many times we, we are fearful and we have all kinds of problems because we don't know what's going on. I know people used to be afraid of uh, going faster than 35 miles an hour. Somebody said, I think back when cars were invented, if you go faster than 35 miles an hour, your soul would leave your body. And uh, <laughs> now, you know, it's quite, quite different. Isn't that? that went away pretty quickly. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, knowledge is a wonderful thing. A lot of times we're superstitious about things we don't understand. And, uh, you know, the people don't understand how certain things work and it's magic or, it, you know, it's un unexplainable. The fact of the matter is John was reacting to something that he only knew. He, all he knew was there was no one found that was worthy to open the book. What a sad thing. But very quickly, Jesus, God, excuse me, sent uh, one of the elders comes unto him. One of the elders we find introduced in chapter 4. And the elders come to him and say, John, hey, John. I don't think it was a cynical or sarcastic thing. I think it was, hey, John, you don't have to weep. If I could put it in today's vernacular, hey, man, stop crying. You know why? There's somebody that's worthy. You don't have to cry about this. You know, isn't that about the priority or the, the, the scenario that we have in our lives? Many times we get overwhelmed by a circumstance. We get overwhelmed by a situation. We don't understand it. I can't see it. I can't understand what's happening. And I don't know what's going to be the end of this thing. And man, it just looks like there's no hope. There's no difficulty that can be over, overcome here. Lord, this is just not going to happen. And I don't understand it. And then the Lord comes along and says, listen, you don't have to cry. What are you, what are you worried about? I'm taking care of this. And I can see John hearing from this elder, don't weep, behold, look, put your eyes upon the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who is worthy, the one who is able to open the book. And I'm telling you, John, when he sees that, I can imagine the thrill of his heart realizing that there was one worthy. And of course, it's the Lord Jesus. Of course, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we find that title tied back to Genesis chapter 49. And now we see the complete picture. Jesus is that lion. He is that worthy one. He is the one who can open the book. And I'm thankful tonight, identified as the root of David from the tribe of Judah. He hath prevailed. I love that idea. He has come out on top. There is nothing that has put him down. It looks like the end of the story. It looks like there's nothing that can be done. But the lamb... The lion always prevails. Praise the Lord tonight for our victorious Savior. And the picture of that, that king that conquers is coupled with this picture of the Savior who is victorious. And I don't just mean victorious in everything, but he is victorious in his mission. 
Uh, specifically, I want you to see tonight, as I, as I quickly move through this passage, I want you to see tonight that this emphasizes the success of His mission here on earth and ultimately in eternity. When Jesus came, He came and He accomplished what He needed to accomplish. The Bible teaches us that His mission was to bring salvation to all men. John chapter 17 and verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Thy Son, and that Thy Son may also glorify Thee. As Thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as Thou hast given Him. And this is the life, this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus whom Thou hast sent. Verse 4 says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John 4, verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. I want to tell you tonight, salvation was purchased. The church was empowered. The believer was indwelt. And Jesus went back to heaven having accomplished what he needed to do. And I'm thankful tonight we have a king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is a conquering king. Uh, uh, excuse me, he is a conquering savior. Someone who has accomplished what he needed to do. And I'm thankful for that victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We find from Revelation chapter 5 that the Bible says in verse number 9, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For why? Why is he worthy? He's the, he's the God of heaven. He's No, the Bible says here in verse number 9, Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. What an amazing picture. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature, verse 13, which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. I don't know that we've heard anything like that before, have we? I've never heard all the creatures of the earth, and all the creatures in heaven, and all the creatures in the sea, proclaiming out. That's going to be quite a sound, isn't it? The Bible teaches that that kind of glory is given to Him. I heard them saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, and fell down and worshipped Him that liveth forever and ever. And I want to just show you this evening that we serve a victorious Savior, a Savior who in every aspect of His life and mission was fulfilled. Victorious. Pastor, why are you teaching all this? Don't you know? I mean, we know that. We know Jesus is victorious. We know He did what He was supposed to do. But my friend tonight, I understand about knowledge that is there, and you can recall it in a trivia situation but there's another type of knowledge that sinks to our hearts and it changes the way we live and think. I want to tell you tonight, if I can bring any kind of confidence to you, if I can bring any kind of knowledge to you tonight through the Word of God, it's to help you to see that we serve a Savior who is victorious. He, he's not dead in the grave. He was not overcome by sin. He, he's not in some obscure place. We don't have some unknown uh, uh, future. It's as clear as we can be. He was victorious here on this earth. He was victorious in death. He is victorious in eternity. And because He is victorious, we have all hope. We have all confidence in who He is. Listen, calling Him the Lion of the tribe of Judah is not just a nice little name. It befits a character of not only a victorious Savior, but of a conquering King. And I'm grateful tonight that we have the privilege to be able to serve this Savior that is worthy. He is the lion that has prevailed. He is the one that we, uh, the, the righteous judge, and His wisdom and His power and His glory are known. And may our song be with the song of those saints in the new heaven. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. 
The victorious and worthy Lamb is that line of Judah, the symbol of strength and power and honor. And this is the picture and the prophecy of our Savior. He is to be worshipped and served. There is none other like unto Him that is equal in majesty and might. And as Psalm 113 and verse 5 says, Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? I'm thankful tonight that we have not only a conquering king, but a victorious Savior. And we serve a Lord who we can rejoice in, have confidence in. Like John saw and was comforted when someone said, don't weep, there's one that's worthy. I'm thankful we have that person as our Savior. May the Lord help us tonight as we live in light of that truth. Lord, thank you for the truth of the conquering king and the victorious Savior the one who has all power and might and honor and majesty, authority. Lord, yet this is the Savior that humbled himself, Philippians chapter.